Welcome to EPG Partialer. We are doing the module on the Marxist approach to state and society. This module is written by Professor Amiya Kumar Bakchi. I am Raghuram Raju who is presenting this module for you. One way of beginning this module is to profess the entry of Marx and Engels with reference to what was the scene earlier. <clears throat> Till Marx, most of the political philosophy was largely preoccupied with the political domain and political domain was at the top. They assumed, beginning from Plato till Hegel, that it is the politics that controls the society. In other words, there is the political domain at the top and that political domain governs largely the social domain which is assumed to be at the bottom. Marx came and brought a very important change, a revolutionary change in the way in which one looks at this configuration. And this is a remarkable achievement. The remarkable achievement of Marx lies in pointing out that it is in fact society particularly the economic aspect of the society at the bottom that controls, governs the political along with other domains like culture, language, literature, what have you. Now, this is an important change in social theory that had not only far-reaching but varied and multiple implications and consequences in social theory. So that's a remarkable achievement and this achievement was initiated by Marx. That's why somebody like Michel Foucault terms Marx as an author of discursivity along with few others. In addition to the revolutionary changes that were initiated by Marx, Marx also contributes immensely to the way in which social theory, uh, the, to the nature of social theory. So with this background, let us look at an important aspect or let us look at one of the major agendas of socialism. How did socialism, that becomes a very important and a pervasive term within Marxist discussion, was used earlier to Marx. Now, two important aspects that governs the nature of socialism or the agenda of socialism are a move from individual or universal justice to social justice. Marx talked about social justice, social distribution. That's the most important point that we should keep in mind. The other important aspects that comes to us while discussing socialism is the idea or concept of equality. Now let me just take a minute or two to explain two important takes on the idea of equality. Equality is an important aspect in Aristotle. Aristotle in his politics claims that inequality is natural and equality is unnatural. In fact, he says that inequality is civilizational and equality is barbarous. He says that it is the barbarians who practice equality. So he says that's not natural. So 
that's an important point that we should keep in mind about bringing or aligning equality with nature. Now, if you look at Rousseau by traveling few centuries uh, in time, Rousseau says that equality is natural and inequality is unnatural. That's why he begins with this, uh, uh, this very popular statement, man is born free everywhere he is in chains. So you have nature brought in the discussion on equality. You have Aristotle claiming that equality is unnatural, inequality in contrast is natural. In contrast, you have Rousseau who talks about how equality is natural and inequality is unnatural. So this is the fulcrum of the discussion that Marx takes it further. As a part of modern package, he accepts the legacy of Rousseau and he finds that inequality is unnatural. That's why inequality should be rooted out. Equality must be established because it is natural. So now you see that the discussion, the political discussion about equality has a lot of metaphysical discussion about the idea of nature and it moves on in that context. So now let us look at, for instance, the use of the term socialism in the modern terminology. The term socialism was first used to attack thinkers challenging the social structure of their time. This included, for instance, questioning the hierarchical structure of society or claiming that the existing social structure was ordained by God or nature. As I already you know, mentioned it in the preface uh, to this module, that inequality was justified by bringing either God or nature. That's the most important point that we should keep in mind. The early socialist rejected this idea and in order to reject the legitimacy of inequality, they also rejected the metaphysics that makes this inequality that is at the political level possible. So the rejection of metaphysical concepts like God and nature was rejected by these people because they are the sources to establish or institute the centrality of inequality in society. Socialist thinkers argued that human beings are free by nature. So this is the, one of the important assumptions that they had made. What is the assumption? Recall that human beings are free by nature. But then they also made a, a second move where they argued that the freedom that the free human beings have is not put to their self-interest. Why? Because this will lead to a, a kind of individualism and the egoistic you know, you know, consequences. So socialist thinkers immediately brought a, another argument where they argued that human beings are by nature have instinct for sociability. That means human beings are born free and as free human beings they have instinct for sociability. Now this is the major assumption made by socialist thinkers. But then there was a problem. The problem was that although this is the major assumption which is which is what they claim is the nature of thing they have to explain why for instance 
there is lot of inequality in society and there is a private property which is based on individualism and doesn't really take factor the sociability factors. So it is in this context they argued that all these things happened because of the misunderstandings of the idea of nature. So they said that although impressed by increased productivity of large-scale industry and advances in science, socialist thinkers opposed the resultant poverty and inequality of income. Moreover, while unregulated private property was the basis of civilization, it also contributed to inequality. This is the important point that they made. Now, let me just recall two things, that there are two assumptions that they have proposed. One, the human being is born free, and two, human being have instinct for sociability. And then they have to explain why there was this unregulated pursuit of self-interest has led to private property, which is an aberration, which is not something that is good for human beings, according to them. So, while recognizing that there are advances in science, technology and other fields, they did find that the growth of private property, which led to the developments in capitalism, are responsible for the further exploitation of large masses of people. Okay. Now, with this, now let's move into the next step in this module. That is, there are important socialist thinkers and they include Claude Henry de Rory, Comte de Saint-Simon and Charles Fourer in France along with Robert Owen in England. So although all socialists agreed on the need to regulate market policies to reduce inequality and eradicate poverty, there existed disagreements on several aspects. Okay. Some thinkers wanted to retain private property while others did not. Certain socialists stressed on human volition while others stressed that social processes shaped individual character. In other words, there are some socialists who assumed that human volition, human freedom can solve the problems, whereas there are others who argued no, society also impacts the human choice. Okay. Now, conservative socialists like Joseph Pruden, Thomas Carlyle and Benjamin Disraeli regarded the Industrial Revolution as a big disaster. Okay. This became a very contentious issue because many people thought that industrial revolution is in fact the indices of human progress. But whereas these socialist thinkers who are branded as conservative socialist thinkers thought otherwise. For them, industrial revolution is in fact a big disaster. It is not a big achievement but a big disaster. These thinkers argued for a return to supposedly egalitarian conditions of medieval Europe where persons were engaged in craft production and small-scale agriculture. Okay, so now you see that they were not the ones who wanted to, for human beings to go, you know, further in time into the future, but they pleaded for the need to return to a a glorious past which is rooted in simple life where people are happy with crafts and things like that and not get into this massive industrial revolution. These thinkers that the conservative socialists were termed by Marx as representing reactionary socialism. The present module will focus on shared propositions that underlie Marxist and socialist approaches to state and society along with alterations 
that took place given the evolution of state and global economy. So let us now look at Marx and Engels. Drawing on early socialism, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels formulated the most widespread variant of socialism. In embarking on this, they attempted to trace the history of social hierarchy and inequality to the invention of agriculture and animal husbandry. Let me explain this a bit. Earlier socialists only made statements about what was the situation and what should be the situation. One of the important contributions of Marx and Engels lies in explaining how what happened had happened. So they used, for instance, that agriculture and animal husbandry contributed enormously to the progress of inequality in societies, which the earlier socialists were rejecting. Okay, that explanatory aspect in Marx and Engels is very, very important. These developments, according to Marx and Engels, resulted in the creation of what they identified as division of labor. And the division of labor, Marx and Engels said, through developments in communication, further resulted in the birth of social hierarchy. Now you, you understand the kind of a genealogy that they are tracing. So there was a state of equality and through agriculture and human has, uh, uh, animal husbandry and through the creation of division of labor has and the communication has slowly contributed to the growth of social hierarchy. So Marx and Engels said inequality was then further entrenched with the coming of property rights over natural substances such as land. This growth of inequality got politically legitimized by the institution of what is called as right, rights on property, that you can own property. And this is a political move, you know, that happened in, within Europe. In addition, Marx and Engels would see social history as a history of struggles between different groups in society. So the class struggle is the most important thing that they have brought into, this, into the understanding of social theory. Marx and Engels argued that the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle. However, what is to be remembered here is, this was not the first time society was seen as composed of classes. Political philosophers such as Jean Bodin, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke and argued that the state by nature was to protect private property rights against the dangerous and disorderly claims of the property less. So they basically saw state as legitimizing property by the property owners and to put down the resentment if there is any by those who do not own property. Adam Smith and David Ricardo had divided English society into three classes and they are landlords, capitalists and wage earners. They also recognized that the interest of the three classes are antagonistic to each other. The conflicting nature of the different classes of society have been recognized by this political economist. Ricardo in particular claimed that the raise in population would result in an increase of land rent. This increase in turn would raise the price of agricultural goods causing wages to increase. High wages in turn 
would eat into the profit of capitalist leading to a decline in investment. This would result in unemployment and a decline in wages. A Ricordian socialist would reinterpret the above claiming that in a world dominated by capitalism, the locus of conflict was between capitalist and workers. Following Ricordian socialist, Marx and Engels argued that capitalism was a system where the capitalistic class consisting of small group of people owned the means of production. The workers or the proletariats who are in large number dispossessed of their means of production had to sell their labor power so as to earn a mere living. Marx defined surplus as gross profit earned by the capitalist minus the wages given to workers. And so the surplus, although produced by the workers, was pocketed by the capitalists. This is the root or nature of exploitation within a capitalist system that Marx pointed out. In this context, Marx argued that workers needed to take control of the means of production and create socialist state. While Marx was aware that the state was an apparatus of repression, historical events such as the resistance of Paris Commune of the workers of 1871 strengthened his view that the communist takeover of the state was necessary and this incident of 1871 made it clear that it is also possible. For such efforts to be successful, Marx recognized that the process would be complicated and required preparing and organizing the working class. Marx argued that changes in the social structure takes place when the relations of production, relations between actual producers and upper classes controlling them, constrained the forces of production. Given this argument, many have labeled Marx as an economic determinist, where the superstructure of the state and society is seen as an outgrowth of the economy. Such a label would, however, misunderstand Marx. And in another module on Gramsci, Althusser, and Bayesian superstructure, we have elaborately discussed this. Marx's analysis of the revolutions of 1848 and the Paris Commune demonstrations prove the contrary and portray that the superstructure also influences the base. So let us look at the similarities and differences between Marx and other anarchist thinkers. Anarchists like Michel Bakunin shared a vision of society that was free of any repressive body protecting and preserving class exploitation. This implied abolishing the state and through decentralization base all programs on the basis of federations of workers' union. Unlike anarchists like Bakunin, who argued for more freedom and less organization, Marx argued for the need to organize working class under a, a, under a safe platform, under a party, that would weed away exploitative characteristics of the state so as to transform the state. In doing so, the aim ultimately was through transformation to abolish the state. That's the one of the major differences Marx had with others, particularly the anarchists. In order to accomplish this task of organizing workers who will then weed away the exploitative nature that is available that is there 
in the state, Marx recognized that the working class need to raise above narrow, short-term self-interestedness and work for the social welfare of the majority that includes the working class. For Marx, this would happen when new class of an egalitarian society were accepted in place of repressing ideas of the ruling class. The difference between the earlier forms of government and the one which Marx envisaged is, in the earlier forms of government, you have very few people holding large chunk of natural resources and you have large number of people not having the you know hold on the natural resources this marx found as exploitative what marx envisaged in contrast is the distribution of natural resources amongst all people so that the exploitation is weeded out marx had emphasized the need to prepare the working class to take over the state and transform the institution to suit a classless society. That is, he found that workers should organize themselves and remove the exploitativeness and also remove class and, and this should lead to what he called as classless society. Lenin, in agreement with Marx, argued that the working class needed to be organized and prepared so as to rid itself of dominant capitalistic ideology. It was in this regard that the leadership of the Communist or Socialist Party had to be exercised. This brings us to the intervention of those like Gramsci, who argued that democracy and the resistance of dominant ideology needed to happen in the daily lives of those political actors who wanted to change society. He also stressed the need to constantly engage with propaganda of dominant ideology so as to limit the legitimacy of the existing order. Extending Lenin, Gramsci argued that in order to enable the end of classless society, it was required for the exploited majority overcome narrow class interest. This would happen, according to Gramsci, by developing intellectual elite who would encompass such an end. Socialism had also focused on gender discrimination, Engels made seminal contribution to understanding the subjugation of women. Other scholars who have made contribution to socialist theory of gender are Alexandra Kolontai and Clara Zetkin. So now, having laid bare some broad features of the socialist theory of state and society, let us relate the discussions to the contemporary world. The Industrial Revolution saw increased use of non-renewable resources. This trend has continued till contemporary times, leading to a competitive race for resources among corporations and state institutions. This has resulted in increased inequality in different parts of the globe, particularly in the use of the non-renewable resources. Furthermore, the increased use of non-renewable resources has led to drastic environmental consequences such as the melting of glaciers and subsequent rise of sea level, the loss of biodiversity and the thinning of the ozone layer. Socialists now must stress on reduction in large-scale industrialization on the use of renewable resources and advocate for better democracy. To summarize this model, we began by looking at what was the scene before the entry of socialists. 
the scene was the legitimation of social hierarchy using the metaphysical concepts like God or nature. And that continued till the advent of modernity. And with the advent of modernity, you have a U-turn in the social theory in the West where the hierarchy or inequalities were rejected outrightly and they tried to institute a new basis for society which is equality and freedom. The socialists before Marx have prepared certain ground to, the, to this kind of way, uh, this kind of looking at society. The socialists before Marx have prepared a ground though not to the satisfaction of Marx before he worked on his own theory of socialism. Okay, they argued that there is something seriously wrong with the way in which society is developed, particularly inequality and exploitativeness. It is Marx who brought a more explanatory power, who explained various stages of the normative claims of the socialist in a very detailed descriptive manner. And that led to a better understanding of not only how societies functioned earlier in legitimizing inequality, and, but, but also how one need to organize to scuttle that kind of process of perpetuation of inequality and then institute different kinds of programs, for instance, how workers have to organize themselves and go beyond their self-interest and root out the evil such as inequality and remove exploitations such as the capitalist exploiting the workers and also attend to the very important and the crucial claim made by Marx, namely removal of class. Because one important de debate that uh, we have seen in the Marxist scholarship is whether class by nature is exploitative. So if class is by nature exploitative, then somebody would, somebody like Marx would argue that you must remove class. And that is the crucial idea underlies his claim for a classless society. Okay. And you have subsequently people like Lenin and uh, Gramsci adding to the understanding and the need to organize the workers and a party and who will then become the leaders in undertaking the accomplishment of this revolutionary uh, uh, goal, namely non-exploitative classless society along the lines of socialism. Thank you.